but you, okay, went out and you bought your own iTero, right? I just, <laughs> want, I just want to let that sink in, guys, okay? And I'm not saying that, you know, for you to show off in any way, Rosh, nothing like that, okay? Yeah. I just really value your mindset. Welcome, Patrice Ranti, to episode 62 of the Patrice Dental Podcast. In this episode, we're going to explore some very big themes about, as an associate, how can you make yourself indispensable to practice? And what we can learn from Dr. Rosh Pan, who is a friend of mine, who is, is known for many reasons, good reasons, but he bought an iTero scanner. Now, these things aren't cheap. So what is what goes inside the mindset of some of an associate who goes out to buy his scanner versus the associate who refuses to even buy a flowable composite, for example, and the associates that are missing out on using the best techniques for their patients just because that my principal won't buy this for me and therefore they're not living up to their true potential. They're perhaps not doing the dentistry to the level they want to be and they're blaming it on the materials that they don't have because of the principal that won't buy it for them. But then guess what? Sometimes you have to make your own luck. So part of the protrusive dental pearl I wanna give you is A, make yourself indispensable to your dental team. If you're an associate listen to this, how are you indispensable to your team? Do you help out with team training? Do you boost team morale? Are you really helpful in collecting reviews for your practice? Because nowadays we can't be leeches, but it works the same way. As a principal, are you providing value for your associate? So I think there should be a this synergetic relationship between an associate and a principal, and we're gonna cover some of those themes today in this episode. The second producer in the poll, oh my goodness, you're getting two, is when I used to work between three different practices, I found it really difficult, a real challenge to transport my camera, transport my loops, transport all the composite and stuff. They, you know, I actually bought a lot of instruments over the years. Uh, how do I transport that around? So I'm gonna show you one way that I did it. It was like using this, like, this big black parrot box. It wasn't actually parrot brand, but I'm gonna show you an example. There'll probably be a video now playing in the background as I'm speaking here, but essentially it's a, it's a big box that you could buy heavy duty and you get these like cut out foam areas that you just have to sit down one day and do the hard work and design the measurements yourself so that you can slot your camera in perfectly because what you don't want to do as an associate is have to dismantle your camera every time you're moving from one practice to the next practice and then reassemble the lens and the body and the flash every time you join a practice or have a barrier to taking photos or in the middle of treating a patient be like oh um just one moment i have to go grab something and go find and troll through your bag to find that thing that you use between practices. It's just not gonna work. So this is something that I bought some time ago. It's been useful to me to transport between surgeries, my equipment. So I'm passing that on to you as an example. So I hope that helps some of you associates who are working between practices and you're thinking, oh my goodness, how can I transfer my equipment from practice to practice? So let's join, let's give our ears to Dr. Rosh Pan, or if you're watching this on YouTube uh, or Dental Tubules, welcome and I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, Rosh Panju, uh, my friend, and welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for having me. I feel like um, a little bit like an imposter because um, I'm nothing like your other guests. But um, don't be great, silly. Great. Really don't be silly that. well just like what you did you messaged me you messaged me some time ago because something interesting happened right you 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 told me for, for some years now you've been listening to the podcast and stuff and i really appreciate uh, you know our engagements and our chats and stuff but then you said that there was one episode you didn't listen to because the title didn't interest you right because yeah. it, it was the it was the airway one right because yeah. no, that's not important but then you listened to it and you were like oh my god this is one of the best episodes i listened to so um, i actually noticed this in my stats when i look at my stats a lot yeah. of people who usually listen to episodes have skipped that one, but it was amazing to hear your feedback. And this this episode, Rosh, today will be just yeah. like that. Because because you <laughs> think you think that ha, you don't have a story, but I'm telling you, I'm going to extract a story out of you because I I've uh, I've really seen value in what your your story is. So before we dive into that, tell the listeners a little bit, just a little bit about yourself before we go into your history and why yeah. I think you're such an awesome guy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, basically, um, I graduated from Liverpool in 2012. Um, and at the moment, I'm living and working in, in, in Surrey. So um, I went to Liverpool as an international student. Um, and um, now I'm, I'm a dental associate at, at a number of practices. And you're doing mostly implant work or restorative or... Yeah, so um, I love anything surgical, even from university, actually. Um, third, fourth year, I loved extractions. I loved the surgery side of it. It was, it was always something that I, I enjoyed. Um, so at the moment, I'm doing um, two days a week general dentistry. And then all the rest of the time, I'm doing implants at, um, at a number of different practices. So at the moment, I'm, I'm overall, I've got seven jobs. Um, but um, only two of them are general dentistry. <laughs> I, I, and you told me something crazy. Like, you, you, you do work quite a lot of the days of the week, right? 
Yeah, and it can get confusing, but I think we've got a system now. So I know like the first and third Mondays of the of the month, I'm in one practice. The second and fourth, I'm in another. Thursdays are the same. Um, so I do I do work hard. Um, and I think um, post COVID, for some reason, I've been just working flat out six months, no breaks. Um, I get a, a few days off here and there, but um, now I think towards Christmas, we've got my in-laws here. Um, it's nice to to just take a break a little bit. Um, so I've got a few days off um, coming up now in December. Well, yeah. people who don't know this, I'm going to reveal it, and I hope you don't mind, is that um, yeah. you, it, it sucks that your in-laws are coming to you. And I don't mean that because they are in-laws. I'm sure your in-laws are lovely, but it they sucks did. that they're coming to you rather than you going to them because cause, cause what you don't know, guys, is that Rosh, uh, Rosh's in-laws live in the Maldives, right? So this yeah, Ro- Rosh visits the Maldives like on an annual basis? Yeah, I do. It's it's a brilliant place. Um, when I told my current principal um, uh, that my in-laws are from the Maldives, he just laughed and he said, you can't choose your parents, but you can choose your in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to put it. So I, th- I think that's amazing. But, you know, the fact that you go to such a beautiful country, I mean, I went there for my honeymoon. So that's just amazing. I remember always, the fact, when I first learned that about you, that always stuck to me. Hey, Rosh, the guy who married the Maldivian lady who, uh, who gets to go to Maldives every year. So you absolutely smashed that out of the park. So you got <laughs> life life management strategy all all in place i know that already but this episode is about some some unique things that i think associate dentists can 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 learn in particular from from your story but also um dentists who maybe are afraid to make the jump into private dentistry so why don't you kick off with your story because because you're an international student you're from kenya you did your bds in liverpool but because of some certain reasons you could not follow the traditional path of going straight and working for in the uk it's the nhs public sector but the you had to you were forced to go private so tell us a little, a little backstory about that yeah, so um, exactly like you said, you know, I came here from Kenya, and um, when you come here to study dentistry from Kenya, in my, you know, my case in particular, there was no way that I was going back. Um, I think dentistry in Kenya is very, at least in the in the um, the place where I grew up in Mombasa, it's just emergency dentistry, generally speaking. So I knew that um, as soon as I came here, I wanted to settle here. Um, it was very interesting the first few years. Um, the culture was so different for me. It was it was a little bit of a shock, but I eventually I think. I adapted and now I'm very comfortable over here. Um, so when I graduated, um, the VT was still covered as a student visa. So I was quite lucky. But beyond that, um, there's only two visa options. One is either you um, you work as a self-employed person, but then you have to invest um, a couple of hundred thousand pounds in a business. Wow. Um, or you work as an employee. Um, uh, but dentists are unique in that sense, aren't they? Because they're self-employed. Um, without having to invest in a business. So there was no visa category for me. Um, so I went into hospital um, and I, I spent about two and a half, three years doing um, uh, doing the different rotations. And Was it I'm surgical? Bad. Was it purely surgical or so what kind of stuff months, were you doing? Six months was mixed. The other two and a half years was all surgical. Um, and um, I'm, I hated it, literally. Um, I remember wow. I, I, I was working in the regional trauma center and the, and the oncology center. My first job out of VT, I started on a Wednesday and I was on call on, on the weekend alone. Um, and um, literally after the ward round, the consultant, in fact, consultant doesn't come on a Saturday, he comes on a Sunday. So the registrar did the ward round with us. He went home. And two hours later, I get a bleep from the nurse. Patients um, uh, had a carotid blowout on the bed. And by the time I got there, the, the, the bay was evacuated. All five liters of blood was on the floor. And I'm just thinking, what have I done? You know, I qualified to be a dentist. I've done dentistry day three on the job. And this is what um, what I'm dealing with. And it was Did the patient was... survive? Did he? No, no. Oh man, that's he tough. Went... It was, yeah. And we had a few of those um, during the six months that I spent there. Um, but retrospectively, I think it's the best thing I've ever done because now, I mean, everybody will come, you know, at a point in their career, especially in early career, where things go wrong. And I think it helps to put things in perspective. You know, at the end of the day, you you do mess up. It is a truth. It's not someone's life. And um, when things go wrong, I just remember that actually that um, you know things could be a lot a lot worse. <laughs> I, li- I like how you said that because it's, it's it, it gives you a different perspective and it appreciates that it's just teeth. Okay, it's just teeth. Exactly. And it's nice to have that. And I always uh, make this joke. I don't think I've made it on the podcast before, so let's do it now. Like. No offense to any of the professions I'm about to name here, okay? So hygienists, right? Um, and some great hygienists I work with, they, they see uh, too much calculus in one place. And, oh my God, look at all that calculus, right? 
then the the therapist might say, oh my god, this uh, my composite has a flash lingually. Oh my god. Okay. The dentist will say, okay, that's that's no big deal. Um, my, my crowns have open contacts. Okay. And then uh, another specialty might be, like, oh my god, oh my god, worry about these things. And then the maxillofacial surgeon is like, none of this matters. Okay. Because as long as your maxilla is in the right place and uh, everything you're breathing is, it's all okay. So I think giving you that level of sort of perspective is is important to have. And a lot of people yeah. who've done max max have, have shared that with me actually. So it really makes you almost calmer in a in when things go wrong in dentistry because you know if, if you get a bit of a bleed while you're doing a crown fit like yes not ideal but it's like okay there's bigger things than this definitely 100 percent. yeah <laughs> so i'm glad i did it and i know that if i um if i was british um uh, because in fourth year we all go to um to the oncology ward and stuff uh, and i think if i grew up here and i didn't have the issue of visas i probably wouldn't have done it and i would have lost out actually so i'm glad i did it and i'm glad that my path in a way took me there <laughs> do you think that uh, you would not be uh, placing implants and being interested in surgicals today was it not for your experiences uh, that you had that you're forced into yeah 100 percent. so basically after my my hospital job so so they basically um want maximum of three years because um beyond that you either become a registrar and go on a training pathway or you go back into dentistry and, and give somebody else the opportunity to, to do that. So um, uh, every year I have to renew my visa. And when it comes to that point, June, July time, I'm like, will I get a job? Will I not? And you're always a couple of months from being, you know, going back to Kenya. And it's quite stressful um, wow. because my, my parents don't have a, a home back home um, and everything they had, they put into my education. It's not cheap being an international student in the UK. Yeah, so yeah. going home isn't an option. So you have to try. So when it, when it came towards the end of my third DCT year, um, uh, we were SHOs now with CCTs. Um, uh, uh, I was like, what am I going to do? Um, and then my wife kept telling me, you know, why don't you um, just apply to dental practices and, and see what happens? And I was like, I know how it works. They can't, you know, they have to apply for a sponsorship license from the home office. Home office isn't giving them out. Um, so um, I just didn't do it. And then she, um, without telling me, went on to the home office website and when there's a list over there of, of almost a thousand businesses that have um, a tier two sponsorship license from the home office. And she went through the whole list and she found um, seven dental practices that actually were um, sponsors. And she um, wrote a cover letter and she took my CV and she just sent it to all seven of them. All behind uh, your back. Yeah, so towards the end she, is when she told me, Rosh, this is what I've done. I've sent it. She's a dream you. woman. Oh my God. <laughs> Wow. She, yeah. So she sent it and then three responses came back and she was like, Ross, you've got three interviews. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. That <laughs> um, is so one cool. One of them is quite famous, um, uh, Shams Mufen. He's, his was one of the practices that I got an interview at. Um, the other two were um, uh, remote. One was in somewhere in Kings Lynn, I think, near Northridge. And the third one was in West Wales in Narberth. Um, and that's the one eventually that um, I got and we opted to go for. So we packed bags from, from northwest England and we went to a little village, a um, place called Narberth. And that's where we, we spent three years. And that's eventually now, Was this happened. private or was this uh, it NHS? Was private. It okay. was private salary. So it was quite a low salary compared to what, um, you know, what my um, colleagues were earning um, on the NHS. Um, but actually, um, I think salaries in the UK are very arbitrary because... Um, where we are now, for example, um, if you know if you're earning seventy, eighty thousand pounds, it's an okay um, living. Whereas in West Wales, what I was on thirty five thousand pounds a year, you could live like a king out there. <laughs> <on that. laughs> you could, um, and the people are lovely, the nicest people I've ever met. Um, we are ten minutes from the beach, and it was actually a good place. And I would never have got got that job if if it wasn't for my circumstances. I think, um, and we we had a great time, and I think um, so. That that was just private, no NHS. Um, How did you feel? Tell me, tap into the feelings that you had because I had, and you must have listened to episode three where I talked about transitioning to private, where I was uh, feeling like you know, the word you use, imposter, right? And so I'm put, I'm putting myself in your shoes. You've done purely max facts. You haven't touched a, a, a diamond burr. You haven't touched a, probably done any tooth dentistry, restorative dentistry in, in that while. And your wife has just all done this amazing pull a, pull a you know, rabbit out of the bag trick. Yeah. Uh, and you're moving now to Wales. Were you not having like anxieties about private, not, not just 
not just private dentistry, but just going back to dentistry again. Absolutely. So absolutely, you're right. Because um, because I did my VT uh, three years in hospital. I haven't touched a drill, um, and now you're going back first into dentistry, and secondly, three years of not charging patients because hospital work is all free, and then talking money to patients is is a huge um, barrier. You're almost uh, apologetic um, about charging what you're charging. And, you know, um, I, I I don't think I was that bad, but I, I just feel like, you know, sometimes I would tell the patient a crown is 500 pounds, you know, <laughs> and you're nervous. Um, but um, I think, um, yeah, I, it was it was definitely quite scary for me. You forget and, that, um, don't you? I, no one talks about that. You all talk about going from Max Fax to, to maybe dentistry and then thinking, um, hey, uh, the, the, the lack of dentistry and lack of experience, recent experience uh, and, and having anxieties about that. But then also, yeah, you're right about going back into a system where it's fee per item, charging uh, and how you yeah. get along that. So so how have you, because now we can just go down this little channel path. How do you think you can advise someone who's in a similar place as you where they go into, uh, they go into a position where they have to now charge patients and they're feeling the same things that you feel like, hey, how am I, I going to do this effectively? How can you get out of the break of the shackles, break free of the shackles of discussing money with patients? Any advice you can share? The first thing I would say is to believe that what you're um, advising the patient is the right course of treatment for them. Because as long as you don't believe it, there is no way that they're going to believe it. And they're very... Um, astute patients are not you know they can tell straight away whether you're 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 off or you know you have doubts about the treatment so um just believe in your plan yourself first and then the second thing is just um you have to say it with confidence um, uh, to the patient that this is this is it. You know, there, there should be no doubt because there isn't because what you're doing is right. Um, and then in the beginning, what I would say is because um, in, in the beginning, what happened to me is when I'm telling a patient the cost in my head, the filling is 120 pounds. And by the time it's come out of my mouth, it's 95 <laughs> um, so, 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 um, so what I started doing is just writing it down on, on, it, it wasn't computerized where I was and you, they have a little um, piece of paper with the cost of dream and everything. So write it down before I tell the patient, genuinely think about what the cost is according to the practice, um, uh, you know, that you're in, put it down on the paper and then, you know, you can't change it. And then just be confident the patient needs this. And if you actually don't do it, because it's happened to me, if, if the patient doesn't go ahead with the treatment plan, they'll come back for, if they don't do a filling, they'll come back for an endo. If they don't do a crown, they'll come back for an extraction. So in my head, I'm thinking, I, I, you know, selling is a bad word, but I have to convince that patient but that actually they want to have this done for their own good. Um, uh, and, and I think that tell them that you're never going to change the price. This is the cost. Um, it is what you're doing, you know, for that patient. And I think you just say it. And I think the more you say it with confidence, um, I think the more the patient believes they need it. Um, and and I think that's how I, I went about doing it. Do you have that's, any tips? Yeah, no, I 100% agree with you. I went through the same struggles. It's called the, the neurophysical drag. So from here to here, you lose 30, 40 pounds, like just from just this direction from <laughs> like that, right? So no, I've totally been there, man. So I would, to add on to what you said, all the fantastic things. The only other thing is eye contact. Make sure you can look patient in the eye. Like so many people, yeah. like I've seen, they give a price and they're like, because I've been in a consultation room, it's like, can that be a uh, thousand pounds? And they're looking away. <laughs> That's not good. Okay. And also watch your uh, voice tone. So don't go like high pitch because when when you say high pitch, it's like you 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 don't get it, or you you are uh, you're not sure yourself. But if you go, if you say something in a lower pitch and you say as it is, like this could be eight hundred pounds, and we will do this, this, and this. It you know patients can sense it, and it's important. And and I, and totally the biggest thing that you said, I think, is that if you do not provide this service for that patient, which is de totally the right treatment plan for them, based on your expert uh, opinion, then the consequences will not be good in terms of the, 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 the outcomes. And if the patient says, I want to be able to chew steak, and you know by not, ha um, by not uh, having this treatment with you, they will not be able to meet their own goals, then you're disservicing the patient. So Brilliant. I completely uh, agree with you. And I, I, it's great that o over the years, you've, you, you know, you've overcome that uh, in a way. And you've shared your feelings about you know, going back into the private dentistry, and, 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 and that can be uh, quite, um, quite you know, it drives anxiety. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> 
I so think the are... um, yeah, with that job as well, I think my, my principal was quite good. Um, he, he mentored me well into talking about um, prices with, with patients. Um, uh, and what he did in the beginning was he would do the checkups, make the treatment plans, and then send them to me. Um, so it became a lot easier um, to, 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 to get into that side of it. I didn't have to, in the first few months, I didn't have to. I mean, this was, you know, six years ago. Now it's a bit different because I do feel a bit more confident in talking about these things to patients. Um, so uh, the, the mentorship was, was great in that practice from everything, from, from discussing just customer service management, going from, from the NHS where they're waiting in A&E for you for three hours to, to having that mindset of, of meeting them at the front desk um, and walking them in, walking them back out at the end of the appointment. Um, it was good. I'm, I'm really glad I went into it. Hey, it's just Jazz here again, interfering in this episode to tell you that this episode is brought to you by Make Me Clear. Make Me Clear is my favorite tool to use when I'm presenting a treatment plan to a patient. So anything, anything that's deemed as expensive, dentistry, I will make a Make Me Clear treatment plan because they are beautiful, they're really easy to understand, and my patients find it really thorough, but not overwhelming. So I've been using this for almost six months now, and I'm loving the results I'm getting. So if you want to check out Make Me Clear, go on the website, makemeclear.com, Join the 21 day free trial. And if you like it, use the code protrusive, that's P R O T R U S I V E, protrusive, to get 25% off your plan. Just join the 21 day free trial and you will see for yourself why I love it so much. So check out makemeclear.com to get on that straight away. Sounds like you you gained a, a lot in that post. And look, you're, you're now an associate in multiple practices. And I just think uh, we need to talk about this following thing like on some of these Facebook dental groups, you see people yeah. po posting like, hey, you know what, My, uh, um, I would like to use air abrasion, but my principal won't buy it. Are there any alternatives? What can I do? Shall I use pumice or whatever? You know, fast forward two years later, oh yeah, I'm still not using air abrasion yet. My principal won't buy it, okay? Just go out and buy the air abrasion yourself, right? <laughs> Just go out and buy it yourself. And, 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 and people think, okay, fine, air abrasion, 450 pounds, 500 pounds. Maybe if you want to get the, the, the poshest one, it's three grand, it's the uh, Aquacare, for example. No, no associates can do that, some, some maybe do. But you, okay, went out and you bought your own iTero, right? So <laughs> I just want to let that sink in, guys, okay? And I'm not saying that, uh, you know, for you to show off in any way, Rosh, nothing like that, okay? Yeah. I just really value your mindset, okay? I really value your mindset. And I've been a big fan of buying my own stuff because what here's what happens, right? When you start buying your own stuff, because one of the reasons the principal might say no is because I think new principals, they want to make their, keep their associates happy but they also want to run a business. And I think all principals have had the following happen to them. They buy something that the associate wants and then the associate doesn't use it or yeah. it, it, it just it doesn't bring any value to the practice, doesn't add anything or, or anything like that. And that is really disheartening, right? Absolutely. But then when you, as an associate, when you buy it yourself and you demonstrate to the principal, hey, I'm using this daily and it's actually improving my outcomes and there is an ROI, even if it's just like the perception of the quality that you're giving, then there's no principle in the world worth their salt who, when it comes to restocking or rebuying or when something breaks to, to pay for the rest and, and, and then buy another one or whatever. What do you think about that? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. The amount of times I've been to a practice um, where they've got uh, the, the fanciest endo kit sitting around doing nothing. Why? Because the new um, associate um, uh, doesn't use uh, this system. They use pro taper and then they've had to buy. So uh, absolutely, it's, it's quite bad from a principal's point of view to get everything. And then by the time the associate leaves, you know, and that's the other thing about my generation. We don't stick to a job. We don't see our failures. Um, we've moved on um, in a couple of years. And I think, um, you know, the principal is sitting with expensive equipment doing nothing. Um, uh, absolutely. And, and I, I think the whole way this started was when I started doing um, implants, I did my, my courses, my mentorships. Um, I, uh, I had a general dentistry position one day a week in a practice in Hampshire, um, and I could see the potential for implants. And that's why I bought my whole implant kit, my motor, my, um, you know, surgical kit, um, condensers, sinus lifts, everything, the whole kit. Um, and within six months, I made all the money back. Um, and b by that point, basically, I was able to, it's one of the, the few places where I'm still, you know, getting 50% as an associate. And, and um, I think that's the reason for it, because beyond that six months, um, I, I've just made, you know, all that investment back um, and the, the principal has seen um, you know the value in it and I think um, I think that's exactly spot on, on on what you said you need to I think um, one thing that Corey Ferran who I, I need to get Corey on the podcast I'm a huge fan of his actually mm -hmm. uh, one thing he says that principals right they have the fear inside them because they've got such a 
a, a business to run, you know, at the end of the month, they need to make sure that all the staff are paid, right? So, and, and what he argues that associates, we don't have the fear, all right? And I, yeah. and I agree with him. Sometimes we don't because it's so easy for us to just go home and, you know, we don't have to worry about if the nurse is sick so much as, 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 as a principal's problem, right? In, in a way. And uh, whether the, the practice is profitable or not, as long as you associate, you get your money on time, you're, you're usually not moaning, right? That's how it is. So it's a different mentality. But when you switch that around and you think like you did, like you bought your kit, you bought your own implant motor, that kind of stuff. Had you not bought it, you would never have done the number of cases had the clinical yeah. exposure, the experience, the income from that, right? So yeah. I am totally with you, Rosh. I think that what you did is fantastic. You make your money back and then you grow as a clinician and, you, and you're able to offer more of those services. And I'm sure your principal respects you massively. And should, should anything happen to your implant motor, I have no doubt that you're, uh, if you just have a proposition to your principal, I'm sure they'd get it for you. 100%, 100%. And the other thing that you said, actually, um, about the, the fear, you know, that principals have in, in running a business, I 100% agree. And I think that's the one thing that um, uh, associates, sometimes we struggle with, that we um, we feel in our head that charging a certain amount to a patient is unethical, but actually discounting that is unethical to the principal. Because at the end of the day, if the principal's business can't survive, then you've got lots of nurses, receptionists out of a job and the business shuts. So you have an ethical duty to the principal to make sure that the, that the practice is running for the sake of the, of the thousands of patients registered with the practice, but also the employees who su survive based on, the, on that business running. Absolutely. And I think uh, if you look at the running costs per day of the surgeries, uh, and then you have to factor in, you know, all the other expenses, then you, 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 when you give a discount, right? Even if the discount is 20%, let's say it's a thousand pound treatment and you discount 200 pounds and now you uh, get, let that patient walk away and they like you more or whatever uh, for 800 pounds, maybe your personal bottom line may have suffered a, a little bit. But as a practice, that's a huge loss because it's something like some stat, maybe you know it, maybe you don't, but I, I, I remember listening to it somewhere where like if you discount by 20%, it actually affects your final uh, take home by like 50% or something, like much greater yeah. than 20% because the fixed costs are still there. Exactly, exactly, 100%. So and how and do you, a lot of yeah. these patients won't actually appreciate it, I think, in the sense that um, associates will put a discount, but sometimes they feel embarrassed to tell the patient they've actually given the discount. So the patient goes home not even knowing that they've had, uh, you know, had it discounted and you, you, it's not actually made a difference to that relationship at all. Amazing. So rule number one, don't give a discount. Rule number two, if you give a discount, make sure the patient knows they have a discount, right? So they can feel that special warmth uh, that, that, you know, really you shouldn't be discounting. But if you do, at least, tell the damn patient that you're going to discount so they can feel it as well otherwise what a massive waste right. no, what a, a huge waste so tell me how do you lug this itera around to multiple practices um so that was uh, it was a huge um decision whether i should buy the flax or the the element two the flax is the laptop version much more portable um and easy to carry around but actually you need a really good functioning laptop if there's any issues with the laptop you have to get another one um and it's a bit slower it doesn't look as slick um so i was really scratching my head over which one to get but i got the element two in the end it's a lot bigger but it comes with a portable stand um, so I've got a little suitcase um, with form, memory form and all that. Um, and um, it's not as difficult as I thought. It just takes about maybe three or four minutes um, packing it up, three and four minutes, uh, you know, uh, unpacking. And it's quite easy. So I take in a little suitcase. So in my boot, um, there's, um, uh, there's implant kits that I log around with me everywhere. And there's a huge iTero suitcase. So there's no room for anything else there. Um, and it drives my wife crazy, actually. <laughs> uh, man, I've been through that, man. My wife was driven crazy by the boxes I've had. I mean, I, I remember in Singapore, I had this massive silver box case. Uh, now I've got something that's like a parrot, but a cheaper version. I don't have it anymore now because I'm mostly at one practice now. And then the other things I just keep it at a practice. Uh, but uh, maybe as part of the pearl from this video, any associates working multiple practices and you've got loads of equipment, I might just show you my setup. So I might put that in there. Uh, anything else you want to add about the iTero or buying equipment before we move on to your MBA? Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I think the Itera has been a, a, a great tool. It makes life easy. The patients, um, the patients love it. Um, and um, uh, when I got it a few months ago, um, my principal actually told one of his um, colleagues about it, and I and I got offered a job based on that. So um, wow, I, yeah. 
so so I'm uh, two days a week. I mean, two days a month, I go to this other practice and, and do a little bit of work for them there, um, purely based on the iTero. And I think it's a little bit like patients. You know, sometimes when we um, ask for a twenty pound deposit for a patient to come in, um, it's just getting that little bit of commitment to make sure that they're committed to coming for their appointment. And it's a bit like that with the associate. Like I, I you know, I think I think the principal knows that this guy is committed to getting you know good quality dentistry done, and I know he'll he'll be a good addition to the practice. Practice. And I think um, that's how I got that position. And he he's made my books full. Um, the, the new principal. I've only that I've only been awesome. there, uh, you know, a few times. And um, he, he uh, he's asking for more days. But at the moment, I think you deserve um, that, Ross. You deserve that because you know the, the reason you're here today is because you know uh, your mentality. People will be listening to this, and a lot of people will just not get it, Ross. There are still yeah. people who will listen to this, and they just won't get it. They'll be like, no, I still don't get it. Uh, you know, how can an associate buy a terror, or why should an associate have to buy an terror? These people are just completely missing the point. I'm sorry, guys, but you're missing the point what you done there is thinking a little bit differently to what you know what the norm where the principal should always provide everything for the associate but you've you've seen the benefit you reap the rewards already you know this led to another opportunity for you and you took it and you're, you're very happy there you're busy there so more power to you and uh, i think there's a lesson here for all associates don't be afraid to pull out your wallet buy something that you need or you want that's going to elevate your dentistry take you to the next level gain you more experience uh, and you will not regret it i think Definitely, hundred percent agree. Tell me about your MBA. Oh my goodness! Like this is exciting. Tell me. I mean, how do you squeeze it in? I mean, this lovely wife of yours, who's done so much in your journey. Like, do you even have time for her? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I'm in trouble a lot of the time, but honestly, <laughs> she's so supportive. It's it's great. Um, it is. I, I am lucky in that sense. I think. Um, but yeah, the MBA. So I think. Um, so, growing up as an Asian in East Africa, Gujarati. I was quite embarrassed with my business skills um, because we were meant to be some of, you know, my, my dad was a, was a great talker, a great person at, you know, talking to people in that way. And I think um, uh, I just felt like, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I'm not geared towards. And, and it's something we never learn in dentistry. Like, you, you know, it, it's shocking that we don't learn in dentistry. Mm. I think there should mm. definitely be some modules on business in there. Um, because even if you don't own a practice, um, just the running of, of a practice and, and some of those things are, are useful information. So that's why I did it. Um, that's why I got into the MBA. And I think um, I, I'm a year into it. So it's six modules and a dissertation at the end. Um, wow. So I'm uh, module three is due now. And I've learned so much. It's, it's just amazing. So where, where so, is it? Where is the which institution is this MBA with? Uh, and how do you squeeze it? Is, is it online learning webinars? What, what, what is it? What's the format? So the MBA, so there's two kinds of people who do an MBA. One uh, is uh, somebody who wants a very good managerial position afterwards. Um, and in that case, the university does mention, um, but the tuition fees are like 80, 90 grand. So, you know, um, one of the top places in London. In fact, I, I, before joining um, uh, my MBA, I spoke to Nilesh um, because I think he did an MBA as well. And mm. I think he went to one of the top universities. Um, for me, I just wanted the knowledge. Um, I'm not looking to, to, to go into it. So I, I went for a cheaper online online version. So it's Arden University. They have, um, uh, uh, I think they have uh, campuses in Birmingham and one in London as well. Um, so that's the university I'm with. Um, uh, it was about £12,000. And um, I think so far, actually, it's, it's really good. Um, it's really good learning. Um, the, the first three modules, the things we've covered, um, one of them was leadership styles. So that, uh, that's great, leadership styles. I think there's different types of leaders, different things work with um with with you know different people that you're working with um uh so that was uh, something very relevant to us i think when, can when, you can uh, you give us one uh gem can you share from the two modules you've done one maybe tangible gem that gem that you think actually no this could be applied to dentistry and this this tip will help dentists anything that you've come across so far that yeah this is really valuable that might help dentists Okay, I'll, I'll brush over one quickly. Um, please, so please. One was, one was culture. I think appreciating that um, we live in a, in a global society and learning about different cultures is important when you're talking to, to staff and different people. Um, uh, but the, the bigger gem for me, I think, was uh, was my current module. I haven't finished it yet, but it's on change management. Um, and uh, I think change management, um, it's just relevant right now because one of our um, my colleagues in, in, in my general dentistry practice where I'm working uh, is retiring. We've got a new colleague, and I think the, the whole system is changing because the practice, the way it's been run, it's been there from the 80s. All the staff have been there from the 80s. Um, I didn't change anything when I went there. I just came in and worked, and the new associate is quite um, new and young and dynamic, and we want to change. And I think um, 
I think the way to to do it is quite tricky. You can you can annoy a lot of people when you're bringing changes um, to to anything in life, um, uh, and I think um, just you know how to, so, so just bring in uh, you know two three changes at a time um, and get people on board with why you're doing what you're doing and make it their idea. Let them own it and do it themselves. Um, so I think that's working quite quite well. I think that's the, the biggest one for me. Leadership as well. I think um, was was a great module. But I think this one, uh, I'm only saying it because maybe it's not that important, but it's very relevant for me. I think at the moment. I think change will always be met. I mean, I'm sure they taught it will always be met with resistance. Like any time a new contract comes out, right? It's like met with massive resistance, right? Even though it, it may be better or worse, or whatever. But it's always met with resistance. Any type of change. COVID stuff is relevant. Uh, and I'm going to give a shout out to my buddy, Calm, Calm Jandu, who works in uh, in Glasgow, right? He's a dentist buddy of mine. And uh, I love what you said about making it their idea because it's sort of something that I picked up from somewhere and I told Calm because I told Calm of my current working situation where uh, I work in a practice where we work from 8 a.m. till 2 p.m., like a shift pattern. And mm. then the next week, I'll work from 2 p.m. till 8 p.m., right? And I love this. It's amazing for uh, having a family life and uh, the podcast for me is it's just, uh, wow, it allows me to do so much more outside of dentistry as well. But then imagine you had to implement this in a, in a practice, right? Because this practice I've been working at has been doing it for like 25 years or something. So mm. Calm loved the idea. Uh, and, and Calm was like, how am I going to implement this? I'm like, it's going to be really challenging. You have to double the staff overnight. Um, you're going to meet so much resistance. And we both, we both concluded that, hey, come, you need to do it in a team meeting where you need to sit down with, the, with your staff, okay? Not in a manipulative, manipulative kind of way, but be like, we want to make two bubbles or we want to make work more dynamic. Uh, has anyone got any ideas? And let them come up with it as a team. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, he's been loving it. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Now... <laughs> so that's awesome oh, man that's so amazing you're doing an mba man honestly it's a massive respect to you uh, i'm really excited to see what what other things you learn maybe i'll invite you back for part two so you can do an mba in half an hour with uh, with rosh panju uh, that would be pretty cool <laughs> so uh, one last question i want to tell you and then i'll open the mic to you to any um, other input that you wanted to do is do you sometimes wish that going back to when you qualified that actually you weren't an international student and then you followed the pathway that was more normal for a UK grad? Do you sometimes think that or are you now thinking different? See, I think that would have been an option. I think a lot of people that come here, um, uh, the, the easiest route actually is to get a spousal visa. Um, and I was I was a rebel. Um, I went and, and did my own thing. So that was not an option. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think... Um, uh, NHS dentistry, I think the only thing that um, I missed when I, because I didn't do NHS dentistry, um, was volume. Um, and I think it's very good in the first couple of years, you, you'll do um, loads and loads and loads of stuff that in private entity, you probably volume wise take maybe four or five years to, to cover. Um, it's a good thing and a bad thing, I guess. Um, it's a good thing because you learn fast. I don't know if you read this study once. Um, there was I think it was in Japan, I'm not sure, but um, what they did is they put two groups of people in different rooms and they told um, one group, um, you have 12 hours and I need you to make 60 pots. You've heard that one, haven't you? No, I haven't. No. I'm really okay. fascinated. So, Go for it. <laughs> so they told the one group, um, um, you have 12 hours. I want you to make 60 pots, uh, clay pots, um, in, in that 12-hour time. Um, uh, and you've got to be quick because otherwise you wouldn't make it. And they, they told the other group of people, you've got 12 hours. Um, and I want you to make just one pot and it has to be perfect. Um, it has to be spot on. Everything should be great about it. And by the end of it, the group that made 60, their 60th one was actually better than the other group's one pot because they've been learning from their mistakes. They've been doing so much of it that by the time they're doing the last one, that it was it was a lot better. So I think that's the one advantage with NHS dentistry that you will do so much work that you will get really good, really fast at general dentistry. Um, and I, I think, you know, um, when people are asking about courses and stuff in the beginning, um, I think, you know, that's one thing to bear in mind. Don't quickly jump into just um, any course. There's many 
maybe a few courses that are, are useful, like occlusion um, uh, or communication. Um, but I wouldn't jump straight into complex, um, you know, uh, complex big courses like, you know, implants or ortho or anything like that. Just carry on doing really good general dentistry and then move from there, I think. Um, so that's the one thing I missed with NHS dentistry. Um, apart from that, I think, um, um, I, I, you know, I would probably have been an NHS dentist um, if I if I had my, my British rights and, and everything. But I think retrospective, there's no regret for sure, 100 percent. I'm, I'm really happy where I am now. I'm a huge fan of these stories about how uh, adversity happens and this happens, but then that leads you to your next path. And because you went and did the max vax, uh, that you enjoyed surgery and then you did implants, and then because of your mentality and your and your grit and your just the nature of the person you are, Ross, you invested in Itero, which led you to the new job. So uh, it's like the butterfly effect. You know, one thing leads to one small action in the past. You yeah. know, leads to these massive waves in the future. So I'm a huge fan of uh, believing that. And I think uh, for those listening from outside the UK, the NHS is like a, a treadmill dentistry. And I don't mean to offend anyone over that, but let's face it, you're seeing a multiple factor of patients compared to in the private sector. And it's about volume. And But the volume, what Ross was saying was that volume is a good thing sometimes when you're a young dentist because it gets you working fast, it gets you to diagnose fast, it gets you to take lots of radiographs, lots of restorations, lots of teeth extractions. Whereas if you'll go fully into private in a, in a quiet list, then how are you going to get those failures? How are you going to get to making your 60th clay pot, right? Which is uh, uh, amazingly, uh, I'm so glad you shared that story with me. I, I, not, not story, that, that study with me, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, didn't, I didn't know about that, but I, I love, it for, for, love it for sharing that. Um, Rosh, uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you, but have you got any final things you want to say? Um, okay, maybe I think with, with associates, I think um, obviously dentists, you know, we're a small world, um, we know each other well, um, and I think it was on your podcast or maybe on another one um, where I, I heard somebody say the, the, um, the best associates are the ones that treat the principal's business like their own, and I think that's quite, quite important, I think, and, and that's what I have noticed everywhere. Um, you, you just go in there, you treat it like your own face, you treat it like your own patients, um, uh, you know, and I think that you 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 definitely get successful in that way, not financially, but just be a, a, a very fulfilled dentist because you you're going to work and um, you know the patients feel like they're not um, in somebody in a corporate structure. They feel like there is that personal touch. The staff feel that you know the, the same thing. Like I know sometimes when when reception is busy, um, at the end of the appointment, I'll just go into SOA, book the patient's next appointment, and do everything myself um, before they go out. So reception just has to take money. And, and you know that's it and I think that's quite important if you can treat it like your own um, practice then I think you'll do well in that practice the, the principal will appreciate you and I think it's, it's good for everybody I, I totally agree with you if you see some rubbish by the uh, you know on the driveway or practice pick it up it, know the name of your cleaner that comes every day to clean your practice okay Understood. know all the protocols for when things don't go go right so you can support your principal uh, and I think I totally agree with you that's only gonna breed the right culture right it's only gonna yeah. breed the right culture uh, and I think from that people will s to see how much you care and when you show the universe you care the universe will reward you in ways you can't imagine so um, Rosh honestly I really enjoy talking to you and i told you i told you it'd be an awesome episode uh, <laughs> and you doubted yourself so again thank you so much for coming on buddy no brilliant thanks for having me i look forward to you know your, your next podcast well there we have it rosh pan everyone thank you so much Rosh, for joining me on this podcast it was really fun to record it's just he's just a down-to-earth guy uh, and i think he's an exemplary associate not just because he bought all that you know scanner and stuff uh, you just listen to him and you think that he has something to give he has some value to give to his practice that he works in and he cares for his staff he cares for his principal so this is how we think we should model ourselves be like rosh thank you so much for listening all the way to the end check out the next episode with physiotherapist Karina panchal where we discuss tmj physio this will absolutely make a massive difference to your patient base if you're seeing patients with tmd and of course if you haven't already signed up for the launch offer for the splint course which i'm so excited to release it's taken years of hard work to actually put something together that covers everything from diagnosis to examination to which splint when which is the biggest most confusing thing that we have as dentists how to know which splint is the most appropriate one for your patient i've broken it down made a system out of it which i'm so proud of now so check it out on splint splintcourse.com, sign up for the update. When it launches, I will let you know.